four outstanding. Please don't leave us, stay for questions. Four outstanding presentations, but especially Aria, thank you so much. That was brilliant. Well done. Oh, thank you. Um, some questions have come in. How long do we have questions? Five. Okay, some questions have come in, which uh, I'll ask the ones from here rather than mine, which will obviously interest those who are in the audience. So, first of all, in, for our first pair of speakers, how do the fraudulent companies benefit from, or how do they monetize their activities? Uh, what benefit is last touch attribution to them, and in what form are they getting the credits? So how are they ripping you off, basically? So it's, it's not so much the, whether it's uh, last touch or first, it, they're looking for places in the pathway where they can steal the credit, right, or feign that they drove the credit. They get ultimately paid by the advertiser. So these people, they look like legitimate publishers and media partners to the advertiser. In the, in the path, pathing journey slide that was up for, as an example, just showing an example of a, a brand using last click as their means of allocating attribution. That's, that's very, very common. Um, and in that particular simplistic case, we're just showing that a fraudster there uh, might inject themselves or attempt to intercept credit at the last possible moment. So they benefit, to, 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 they, they benefit by receiving payments from advertisers that have been misdirected, um, if, if you will. Thank you, guys. Um, question from me on, on, on the Airbnb environment. What's the percentage between the conversion and the attribution fraud? Is it pretty even, or is there a lot more of it happening in the conversion side or in the attribution side? I actually don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I, there was evidence of both, um, and I think the people that turned out guilty, like, it was both, and um, they both matter in different ways, really, so I don't know what the answer for you is, unfortunately. Well, there you go. There's, some, there's a takeaway. <laughs> um, final question for you guys. Um, setting the alarm trips when you actually click over into high-risk high risk attribution or high-risk conversion. Do you change that over time based on past experience, or do you set it for a period of time and then review it, or is it, is it totally dynamic? That's a really good question, and it, it is dynamic. It does learn. It is changed over time. It's purposely set as a dial uh, to provide that sort of test and learn feedback. So you're always trying to calibrate it. With any model, you'll never be 100%. So the you know the idea is to, to keep tuning it. Um, you're always going to let some fraud get slip through. You can't catch all of it. But to answer your question, yes, uh, absolutely, Fine. it's more dynamic. Thank you very much. So moving on to the Via example um, and some great business learnings there, David. I was really impressed that the critical success, the last four, four items, they were business based and they were customer based, and that's, that resonated and came came out very clearly. Um, in terms, though, of the personalization, how far, Ariel, can you take the personalization? I mean, or do you have a set of buckets around the, you know, the way in which you want to adapt the product? Because there must be financial and investment constraints on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, everything that we do, we have to, to weigh um, like the pros and cons of doing it. But um, I think the benefit of operating um, within a, a growth team environment, um, we're really testing things before we're rolling them out broadly, is we have the freedom to test. And I, I think that's like core to everything that we do within our organization. So um, before, you know, trying to really like um, push the limit um, in regards to different features that we that we want to roll out or, or different um, things that we think are like core to our business, we, we test it so that we have them, the data that we can then take to either the financial team or the product team um, or whoever else we're, we're competing with for resources to, to you know make our case so um, it's a, a broad question I don't have like an exact answer but basically yeah. we we try to test everything before um, really making like the internal case to um, to roll it out within our native app cool so a Friday afternoon six o'clock Red Lion Square to gin bar in uh, Covent Garden could be customized yeah definitely I think um, you got a customer <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one, one more for you guys, uh, which I think is only fair, which came in also uh, from here. Here we go. What advice would you give, uh, I mean, to both of you, 
would you give for brands that want to start measuring their consumer CLV but don't have direct consumer channels? <laughs> and that was anonymous. <laughs> Great question, whoever it was. I mean, I would say look at, look at the data that you do have and try to, to figure out um, how creative you can be with it. Um, not only um, how far can you, you push it and look into different things, um, but also what additional data you would need um, to build on top of this to, to really have your answer. And then from there, you can start exploring other options. Um, if you're you know, integrated with a partner like MParticle, you could not only talk to MParticle, who has an understanding of the entire ecosystem, but also look into the different third-party channels that they are working with to enhance other customers' data sets. So um, that I, I would say that would probably be the place that I would start. Probably Thank have to take a more sample-based approach. The people in Cantar could probably answer that uh, better for us from the previous presentation. But uh, it's a it's a great question for this category because in the Lyft IPO, um, it sort of came out that I think only 10% of the customer base are profitable. Uh, the the rest of them are extremely unprofitable. And then you know you're trying to get that upper echelon of the 5% who have very high CLV, uh, and without that, the business model just tanks. And um, you know that's that's essential in these high growth businesses that you're keeping a close eye on uh, your most profitable cohorts while also not limiting your your market size. So Via is very attentive to that. You know a lot of the other companies that I mentioned are very attentive to that at the at the individual user. And that's another advantage of having a persistent customer database is that you know most like DMPs, for example, or other sites of marketing tech um, are very uh, short-term focused and um, you know the the big innovation around the CDP is that here's an operational database that persists over the lifetime of the, the customer so you can look back and see the true value uh, of every step taken along the journey. Thank you David and two businesses there innovative businesses and I wish you all best of luck and terrific presentations thank you very much please thank the speakers. Great job. Thank you.